uh, we're, we are delighted that you're here. Thanks for coming to the um, two, two, uh, 200th year anniversary, and thanks for take, coming uh, to this uh, presentation. So we go until 5.30. Uh, we will have uh, presentations from each of our panelists, uh, and then uh, we will open it for conversation. And so we will pick on each other, and you should feel um, uh, perfectly entitled to pick on us. Uh, I guess uh, you're all alumni, so we picked on you uh, sometime in the past, or, or our predecessors did, perhaps more accurately. Uh, I'm Mark Ramsire. I have uh, taught here since um, 98, and I graduated in uh, 82. Uh, and I uh, teach corporate law and various uh, Japanese law subjects. Uh, and I was asked to put together a panel that uh, looked at other countries, and I thought, you know, I should just have my good friends come. Uh, and so, uh, so I lined up uh, four very good friends uh, and thought, well, what do we have in common? Well, we all teach foreign law. Uh, or we all teach the laws of uh, other countries. Uh, and so that is, that's why the title is what it is. Uh, we're going to go from um, your left to your right. Uh, and so we'll start with Ben Liebman, who teaches at Columbia Law School uh, and works in the China field uh, and has been doing all sorts of uh, interesting work, uh, scraping websites and, and the sort. Uh, then we'll have Frank Upham, uh, who teaches at NYU and works on uh, the Japanese law field, but also uh, reads and speaks Chinese as well. And so he's um, sort of maybe that's maybe that's why he's between Ben and uh, Dan Foote. <laughs> um, Dan Foote uh, is uh, a was a year ahead of me in law school and now teaches uh, at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and has taught at uh, Washington University of Washington's uh, wonderful Japanese law program uh, as well. At the University of Tokyo, uh, he is the professor of legal sociology, I believe, right? Uh, and so he'll be talking about uh, teaching there. And Mitu Gulati is a professor at Duke University. Uh, and I asked him what he taught, and he said, oh, lots of things. Um, but uh, contracts and various uh, international courses, uh, and uh, does very, very interesting work on international bonds uh, and uh, what happens when countries don't pay. Okay, so uh, in that order, uh, Ben, please. Great, thank you, and thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon for having me back up uh, to, to talk to all of you. So. Uh, I just figured out two minutes ago that we were supposed to talk about the delights, the challenges, and the conflicts. Uh, luckily, I had three points prepared, because uh, I thought well, my instruction was to be brief, so I just have three points. So I'm going to have to figure out very quickly which is the delight, which is the conflict, and which is the challenge. Uh, but uh, I actually took our task to be to sort of reflect on how the field of comparative law or the challenge of teaching foreign law, uh, had those challenges had changed. So. Uh, delight, I guess, would be students. Uh, that's a very nice thing to say with students in the room as well. Um, I think I've been teaching at Columbia for 15 years, and I think the, the most striking change to me in terms of students and also sort of how it changes how I think about teaching Chinese law is that our students are vastly more international, international today than they were 15 years ago, especially within the JD program. I think. We're probably about 15% uh, international JD, maybe a little higher. And uh, it means that you know, the, the challenge is not so much how do we teach Americans, say, about Chinese law or about the law of any foreign country, but it's actually often how do we teach students from, in my case, how do we teach students from China about the law of China, uh, many of whom have, are from China but have never studied law in China before. And that produces a very interesting and a different conversation that existed in my Chinese law course maybe even five, 10 years ago. Uh, it's a good conversation. I think it's a very positive development, uh, but, but it's, it's a noticeable shift in, in the makeup of the class. And uh, I, used to, I used to like to say that, you know, who takes Chinese law? And it's like a third people who 
you know, were from China or had particular uh, cultural ties to China, third people like me who like lived in China at some point, and a third people who just took it for the hell of it. Uh, uh, usually second semester, three L's. Uh, but, um, uh, but I think that's changed a little bit. And uh, I think it's a good change. I actually now teach Chinese law to one L's as well. Um, so it's one of our one L electives. Uh, but, but, and I'm happy to talk more about it, but it's a very different conversation, I think. And it's really interesting to have a conversation that has people who've often lived in China uh, but are not Chinese alongside people from China who may not have actually ever studied their own legal system before. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's one change. So that's a delight. Uh, conflict. Uh, so uh, other than just sitting next to Frank, which often produces uh, conflict, uh, it's the, uh, the uh, sarcasm. Sarcasm, that's right. The, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really the case that teaching foreign and comparative law is seen as far less important in the legal academy than it was 15 or 20 years ago, and certainly than it was 30 or 40 years ago. I'm going to put that under the table. And uh, I was happy to see that I'm still the junior member of this panel based on our years of graduation. Uh, it's not often that I get to be the youngest person uh, anymore. So the, um, but, but I, I think it's worth thinking about. And, and uh, you know, at Columbia, which is really a, traditionally been very strong in the teaching of foreign law, uh, we are, have significant enrollment in classes in European law and Chinese law, uh, less so in Japan, and then, but the, and that's all of the foreign law courses taught by faculty. And I think that's a real change. And, and so I think, and I don't think this is a Columbia issue, um, I think there's less attention generally. Uh, I was very involved in our, our and this isn't just a, a faculty issue, right? I was very involved in our efforts at Columbia to expand our curriculum to cover Indian law, which we've done, I think, over the last five, seven years pretty successfully. But the student demand is much lower, say, for India than it is for China. And I was really struck. I taught a seminar some years ago, maybe four years ago, about China and India. And everyone in the class was interested in China. And I was like, well, where are all the people interested in India? We had one student actually um, interested in India. But it, it's uh, so, so how do we think about the demand side of the getting students to take foreign law is also, I think, a challenge and, and worth discussing. And I'd love to hear my colleagues on this panel's thoughts about this. Um, and you know, I think that, that there's a little risk aversion amongst our students right now. Uh, I like to believe that they should take Chinese law because it's interesting, not just because you know, China is important, uh, but, uh, but there's more market demand, say, for China than there is for, for some other uh, countries. And, and it's harder to get people appointed, I think, in law schools today who are just specialists in foreign law, have really deep knowledge about foreign law. I think that's less value than it used to be. You know, the, the response is often, okay, we don't need, you know, the specialists because everything, everyone's doing transnational law, everyone's doing comparative law. Uh, and a lot of our colleagues are doing, you know, aspects of comparative law. And, and, um, and I'd like to say that everything's becoming comparative. Uh, my torts class is quite comparative. My students read French cases yesterday and Chinese cases a couple weeks ago alongside Paul's graph and things like that. But, um, but I think that's an exception. So, so that's sort of the second point I'll put on the table, the, the challenge of getting both uh, our colleagues and also our students more deeply engaged in studying foreign law. And then third and, and final point is a point about research and the challenges we face conducting research on foreign law. And what I'm going to say now is a very China-specific point, uh, and I have no idea if it applies to other jurisdictions. Uh, but, but for those of us who study China, we're, we're at a moment where it's both vastly easier and I think increasingly hard to study what's going on in the Chinese legal system. It's easier because we have much, much more information available than we've ever had in the past. When I was a student here 20 years ago, the way I conducted my research was by paying undergraduates at Peking University to go to the library and flip through like three years worth of newspapers to find any reports about legal cases, right? So. Uh, I was telling Mark earlier, right, right now I, we just are in the process of downloading all 32 million cases that have been made publicly available by the Supreme People's Court of China on their website. So that's a big shift from like looking at newspapers to actually having a database of you know, 30 million cases. Uh, and, and that's a positive. So there's a vastly more information available about China in some areas, especially judicial decisions, than ever in the past. But it's, we're also at a moment for those of us who do qualitative work on China where it's much harder to do the work uh, than it's ever been, certainly in my career. There's much more scrutiny of it. Uh, it's much harder to get law uh, lawyers, actually. Lawyers everywhere talk. But, uh, but judges, it's much harder to get access to the courts in China than it was uh, just even a few years ago. And so we're in a, a very interesting, I think, inflection point where we can get certain types of information. We can get big data about the courts. But 
traditional qualitative uh, interview-based work is much harder to do. And, and that raises really interesting methodological questions of, of both about what types of subjects we choose to study going forward. Do we study the stuff, we study the data because it's there, uh, what this data may or may not tell us, what's missing, uh, and also sort of what, how this guides our research more generally uh, as we move into this big data world. So Mark and I were talking a little before, I mean, I think China is pretty exceptional in terms of the volume of data and the accessibility of the data that's available. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about some of the particular challenges of trying to do big data and uh, work on the Chinese legal system. But that's a challenge. Uh, it's a fun challenge to confront and to think about, but it's a challenge nevertheless. All right, I'm done. I guess that means that I'm on. You're on. Uh, first, oh, OK. Um, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I want to thank Martha and Mark for inviting me. I think it's, uh, first I thought, you know, bicentennial, uh, you know, <laughs> you just have to wait a while. And, <laughs> and, and then I thought, that's 1817, and thinking about what the legal profession was like then. And so it, it actually has made me, for the first time, interested in like reading a history of Harvard Law School. But anyway, it's, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I, uh, it's also rare, as, as Ben said about himself, it's also rare for me to be the youngest person in the room. Um, <laughs> what's frightening is that sometimes I am, um, but not this time. Uh, I have five points, and I'm going to talk um, hyperbolically. I'm, I'm going to say some things which, and I know you've all uh, I know that this is not being recorded, and I know that you've all signed comp <laughs> uh, confidenti confidentiality agreements, so I I'm, I'm feel that I'm safe to say this. Uh, but I'm, I am going to perhaps exaggerate a little bit what I believe, but it is what I believe. And I was very encouraged by a conversation I had with Ben just before we started, in which he asked whether or not 40 years ago, uh, they taught European law at Harvard Law School. Substantive yeah. French yeah. law. Yeah, 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 well, yes, yes, yeah. I understood uh, French law, yeah. It, yes, they did. Um, and my guess is, and not a guess, I know they did that at Columbia Law School, too. So my point, I'm, uh, um, I'm not going to talk about the delights and the conflicts, I'm just going to talk about the challenge. And I think that the challenge is that comparative law in the United States is, I don't know, it, it, crisis implies concern. And uh, I don't think there's any concern about comparative law in the United States, uh, except for a few people who, who practice it. And uh, I think that that's troubling, and I'll give you a couple reasons why I think it exists. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what I, uh, what I, th why I think comparative law is important. Um, I think the important, the most fundamental reason for me to understand about other people is to understand about myself. Right? It's very hard to understand who I am without thinking about other people. I think that's true for legal systems and maybe for everything else. But So I think the ultimate reason for comparative law is to understand American law better if you're an American. If you're Japanese, is to understand Japanese law better. Now that, that um, sounds very um, airy-fairy, for lack of a better word. Um, if you want a more instrumental reason, more useful reason, uh, then it's uh, a way to improve one's own legal system. It's very hard to improve, a, to think about things that can make fundamental changes in a system when you're inside that system. Uh, and the best way, or one way, at least my way, of thinking about how to make the United States, and I, <clears throat> Mark mentioned, uh, you know, I, China and Japan, but also uh, I'm the Will family 
professor of property law. Uh, you know, who knew? Uh, but I've been teaching property law for uh, many, many years. Um, and it's comparative law that's given me insights into property law, and property law that's given me insights to comparative law. So the, so the first reason is just curiosity, just to learn about yourself. Uh, the second reason is instrumental, to try to improve one's own legal system. Just to give you a couple of examples, um, one of the most illuminating books that I read about the United States was written by Marianne Glendon, who teaches comparative law here. Uh, and it was called Rights Talk, and it was about Europe. And it was about the way the differences between American rights talk and European legal dialogue discourse is what the fancy word would use. And then if you want it, that's, that's sort of the curiosity, learning about ourselves. You want a book that tell you how we might be able to make the American legal system better? There's the book that, just, that Mark just wrote about second best, uh, uh, second best justice, right? Yeah, you, you remember it, yeah. Uh, <coughs> um, so I think it's, it's important that we study other legal systems. Uh, we do it very, very little. Um, and I think there are two reasons. One is the, that the globalization. It's, it's, Ben's, it's what Ben said about everybody's doing, and I don't know whether you've used comparative law, or, but everybody's doing transnational law. Trans, I mean, every, there's this sort of unification. Uh, there's a thin skein of law over all these 189 jurisdictions or whatever. Uh, and that, we skate on that, and we don't see any reason to deal with the peculiarities of each system. And uh, that's the focus for practice, uh, and, it pro and it probably always has been, and it probably always will be. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, except that it detracts our attention from learning about other places. We learn about the global system. Um, it, I, 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 I've been at NYU for 25 years. When I got there, I was the first faculty director of the Global Law School program. And at the time, I unfortunately, as I was a newcomer, used the word globaloni. Um, <laughs> now, uh, you can't find a law school website without global on it. I thought it was incredibly pretentious. Now it's commonplace. But it's not knowing other places. It's knowing global only um, or globalization. Uh, the second reason, and it's, not a, it, it's a bad reason, is the overweening arrogance of the United States. A, and I have a handout. It's called the overweening arrogance of the United States. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I didn't mean for you to hand it out. I was going to put it up here. Okay, anyway. Um, the, uh, in other words, um, I think the American legal education has lost both reasons to study comparative law. One, to, to learn about ourselves, and second, to learn how to improve ourselves. And I think the, the reason that I'm going to talk about is that we are convinced, we know in our souls, that we have the answers. Uh, and I think that comes out of uh, the end of the Cold War. I think it comes out of a justified sense that our legal system is pretty good. I criticize our legal system, but I primarily criticize, what I primarily criticize is our lack of understanding of our own legal system when we go overseas. So we preach to China 
uh, to virtually every country in the world how to improve themselves based on a model that looks only vaguely like our, what our model, what we really do. It looks like our model. It doesn't look like what we really do. And the perfect example of that is something called the Democracy, uh, Human Rights, and Labor Program at uh, the State Department. I am part of uh, something called the U.S. Asia Law Institute uh, at NYU. Uh, I uh, and my former teacher, when I arrived here in 1970, I came here because of Jerry Cohen. Um, he was my teacher then. He's my colleague now. Uh, and we started the U.S. Asia Law Institute. Uh, except for private funds from individuals, um, all, of our mon all of our funds are to improve China. We receive money to improve China. So if you look at your handout, uh, this, is, this is from the Department of State website. The second paragraph starts out, the, the HRDF, which is the Human Rights and Democracy Fund, is designed to act as, a state, as the department's venture capital fund for democracy and human rights. Then you drop down to the next paragraph. This is often politically sensitive. I reference Russia, Facebook. Um, HRDF programs have a dramatic effect on democracy, promotion, and personal liberties. Not in the United States, of course, but apparently in China and, and other places. Uh, the programs enable the United States to minimize human rights abuses. Again, not here. Uh, support democracy activists worldwide. Open political space in struggling or nascent democracies. Um, when you think about the reaction to Russian meddling in our own system, this is pretty stunning stuff. Um, but at least we're candid about it. Uh, the problem that I have is not uh, that we're supporting human rights and so on. The problem is we're not learning about places. So we get money from China from this program. We are prohibited from learning about China. Okay? We can't take that money to do research about Chinese law. We can only do it to improve Chinese law. Uh, and we, i just give you one anecdote, because uh, I do property, I'm very interested in urbanization. There's no better place to study it right now than China. Okay? So, I carved out a slice of this money, and we had a, a program in Shanghai. We invited lawyers, activists, bureaucrats uh, who did land use in China to come, and we set it up as the U.S. Again, this is off the record. We set it up as USALI always sets up things as a way for, to, to meet as equals and exchange views. I got there, and I found that there was somebody coming from the embassy in Beijing, the American embassy. And I had been told when I applied for money for this not to say anything about learning about China, because that would not, we wouldn't get money. And I thought, oh boy, he's going to come down here, and she's going to report back that we listened to what the Chinese did, and we wanted to find out what they'd done. And not only so we could correct them. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I was literally, I was worried uh, because of the damage I might have been causing to my colleagues back in, in New York if I had screwed this up. And so I met the, the, the uh, embassy staffer who came down, and I didn't know how to approach it. Uh, and when I finally got around to talking about it, she, said, you know, she laughed and said, don't worry about it. Uh, and I didn't worry about it. But I worry about it fundamentally. Because if we only look at the rest of the world as thinking about how can we make the rest of the world look more like we think we are, then we're going down, we're just feeling around not knowing and not having any new ideas no way to think outside of our own self-referential uh, universe. Uh, 
Wow. Uh, I, I will uh, I actually have some, some remarks that uh, tie to that. Uh, first, I, I'm in the situation uh, somewhat unusual. Uh, as uh, Mark had mentioned, uh, I teach at the University of Tokyo. Uh, I teach Japanese law, law and society, uh, in Japanese to Japanese. Uh, and I've been there now 17 years. Uh, so, uh, and that's actually my, my Lieben uh, reference. Uh, I promised Ben a, a reference earlier. Uh, shortly after I started at University of Tokyo, his father, uh, Lance, who was on the visiting committee at University of Tokyo as well, but uh, uh, said to me that uh, he and his wife, Carol, uh, had a wager as to whether I would last five years or not. <laughs> I don't know who had the over and who had the under on that one, Fine but whoever that. had the over, uh, uh, I, I, I've exceeded it. Uh, it um, but I, I thought I'd uh, give some reflections on, on what it's like uh, to be uh, in, in that position. Uh, it's, uh, and first, in, in terms of the delights, uh, challenges, and a bit on, on conflicts as well, uh, delights, uh, again, students. I've got great students, a number of whom are here. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's constant discovery. Uh, in any field, I think that's true, but especially when you're in the sort of position I'm in, uh, unfortunately, or I, I still find myself uh, quite surprised, uh, sometimes shocked. Uh, uh, one is uh, access, uh, access to information. Access to information about the courts is uh, something uh, where recently I uh, have among other things, uh, uh, being uh, told that the uh, prosecutors, uh, in uh, some cases, uh, uh, refuse to provide even the name of uh, the name of witnesses, even to defense counsel. And there is a right of confrontation in the Japanese Constitution. I don't know how that can be the case, but I'm told it is, in fact, the case, that, uh, uh, that the names of the witnesses are so sensitive, and they're afraid that the witnesses might be intimidated somehow, that they won't even tell anyone except, presumably, the judge uh, who, uh, what their identity is. Uh, so uh, this uh, discovery uh, continues to go on. Uh, but uh, one of the, one of the uh, great uh, benefits uh, for me of being where I am is the opportunities for research on, with teams of Japanese researchers. Uh, at times, they even give me the privilege of naming me lead researcher, and then somebody else does all the work, which is even better. Uh, uh, but a uh, chance to uh, engage in uh, empirical, uh, extensive, uh, major, uh, long-term uh, projects uh, that uh, I, I had I been still at the University of Washington, I'm sure I would not have, have those opportunities. Uh, but a, another of the delights uh, re relates to uh, Frank's comments, uh, and that's uh, kind of the flip side. Japan, there is a real receptiveness uh, to uh, hearing what others think of them. Uh, and, uh, it's, um, and it's not, not only praise that they want to hear, if anything, uh, certainly among academics, uh, it's criticism. Uh, and this was brought home to me rather vividly a couple of months ago. A major Japanese publishing company, uh, Yoanami Shoten, is coming out with a seven-volume series on criminal, uh, criminal justice. Uh, and they'd invited 40 leading authorities on criminal justice to provide essays for the volume zero. This is the uh, initial one setting the framework for it. Uh, and I was one of those invited. And the theme that they asked all 40 presumably to write on is, this is what is strange, weird about Japanese law. This is what needs to be improved. Uh, and I wrote back and I said, I have no desire to be a part of uh, a project that starts as its premise, that Japanese uh, criminal justice is bad and needs to be improved. Uh, I've written uh, widely on criminal justice uh, and, among other things, the, the commitment to rehabilitation uh, in, in the Japanese system is something we should be learning from. And in fact, in much of my writing, it's uh, uh, aimed at what the US should be learning uh, from Japan. Uh, so there is that attitude. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there is uh, this real receptiveness uh, and uh, at least willingness to hear and eagerness to hear. Uh, I teach a, a course. Japanese law as viewed from abroad. I took this over. Uh, others, uh, uh, Professor Fujikura had uh, started this uh, seminar uh, back in the 1980s, uh, so I <coughs> succeeded to it. He'd retired. Uh, but uh, students who are 
they're truly interested and uh, bring in lots of viewpoints, yours, Mark's, uh, others, uh, uh, but uh, getting a, a, a wide range of views. So that is uh, really one of the uh, one of the joys of being uh, in Japan. Uh, some of the uh, the challenges. Um, I guess the first, and when I thought about challenges, the bane of my existence uh, is grading roughly 400 essay exams handwritten in Japanese. Uh, and I swear that when I was being recruited for this position, recruiting, uh, it was actually kind of weird. It was uh, uh, sounding out. Uh, it was uh, sounded out back in the mid-90s, and I said, no, you'd want me to teach Anglo-American law. That's not what I do. Uh, and then uh, about uh, five years later, they came back to me, and it was for the position in sociology of law, where it's, the focus is on the uh, Japanese law and society. Uh, but uh, it was kind of, we're thinking about putting you on the list of people being considered for this position. But before we do so, we, we, we need to know, if we do so, would you accept it? And I said, well, uh, and then uh, the ne next stage, uh, we're thinking of narrowing it down to the, the short list. Uh, but before we do so, we need to know, will you accept? And I, I said, you know, can I, can I consult with people? And they said, no. <laughs> so this is absolutely confidential. It, uh, can I talk to my wife? <laughs> uh, well, that's OK. Uh, and finally, they grudgingly said I could talk to my dean at the University of Washington uh, and to John Haley and Dan Anderson, my colleagues uh, in, in Japanese law. But that was it. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, so I, I was never quite sure whether, when there was an, <laughs> there, there clearly must have been an offer and acceptance, but I, I can't put my finger on exactly when it happened. Uh, but uh, so that's another. Uh, but I, I swear, during that process, they said, well, of course, when I raised the grading issue, of course, we will get help for you to do that. Uh, but there's a saying in Japanese, uh, once you've caught the fish, you don't need bait anymore. Uh, and uh, it's uh, never been forthcoming in 17 years. Uh, that ties to, there are also some, uh, one of the, it's an inbred faculty. Uh, virtually everyone uh, is a University of Tokyo grad, which means they basically know the procedures. They, they don't know all of the, 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 the rules that relate to faculty, but they certainly know how the, the institution is structured. Uh, they, that leads to lots of surprises. Uh, for me, one of the great surprises was great the first time grading these exams. And I'm getting to the end of a few and finding uh, this comment at the end. Please, professor, if I do not get an A, Give me an F. In the Japanese system, the student receives a transcript that shows the Fs, but to the rest of the world, it doesn't exist. There are a few universities where it does, but uh, at most, most universities, if it's an F, it just does not appear on the transcript that goes out to anyone except the student. Uh, so, yes, <laughs> you didn't know this, did oh, you? Yes, you. yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, but, but many uh, experiences of that sort as well. Uh, one of the other uh, so challenges. What do do? Yeah. <laughs> what, what do I do? Uh, what do I do? Now I give a lecture to my. You give what, I give, I give, a, I give a, a talk at the end of my class, say, don't do it, I will ignore it. Uh, so, if you, if you don't feel, if you don't want it, and they actually get another. Uh, I think they're about to change this, but students, it's a two-hour exam. They can come in, read the exam, and say, oh, no, the, those weren't the questions I prepared for. Uh, and they must sit there for 30 minutes. They can't leave until the 30-minute uh, mark is passed. But then they put it in a box that just says, I, I give up. Uh, and it's uh, completely discarded. So uh, they get that shot as, as well. Uh, it's, I see some people nodding, so yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, but I give them a lecture, say, I will ignore it. Uh, I also say that uh, one of my colleagues said, oh, I love it when I see that. I just give them an F right from the start, and I don't even read the exam. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, I, I, I think he was lying. Um, <laughs> The, uh, one of the other, both challenges and conflicts, uh, I, I knew that University of Tokyo has a seating chart for faculty in seniority order. Uh, it's uh, recently come, uh, come a very uh, uh, apparent to me. I am now 
in one of the two top seats. <laughs> I started, there are six or three consecutive rows on either side. I started in one of the back rows, uh, and now in just 17 years, I'm one of the two most senior. Mandatory retirement age is 65, so it's, uh, uh, but, uh, but, so, but I, I knew that going in. Uh, I had not been prepared for another shock at my first faculty meeting. I knew I was the second foreigner on the faculty. The foreigners outnumbered the woman. There was <laughs> one woman on a faculty of over 70. Uh, and that, has, uh, that became one of my, uh, my uh, pet, well, my uh, pushing for change. Uh, first low level shaming, uh, then somewhat higher level shaming, then uh, at a faculty meeting saying, that yet again, you've just brought men to, to us. Uh, uh, this is uh, truly shameful. Uh, back 10 years ago, when I, when, that it was, uh, uh, even then it was shameful, but another 10 years has passed and nothing's happened. I think one more woman was hired thereafter, but uh, it's, um, no. Uh, the, um, so uh, that is uh, one of the challenges. I guess, um, the uh, conflicts, uh, that is one. But in Japan, I guess uh, you seldom know. Uh, it's, uh, there's kind of silence, but it's not, uh, at least in my experience, uh, no one saying flatly, foot, you're wrong, you're crazy. Uh, and uh, it's rather just kind of polite silence. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, had the, the opportunity to serve on a number of uh, government advisory councils. I had the temerity uh, to write a chapter uh, about uh, my experiences on one of these uh, uh, councils. I haven't been asked to serve on any more councils since uh, publishing that chapter. Uh, perhaps uh, because, among other things, I uh, took a great uh, uh, um, aim at uh, their the, the lack of transparency uh, that uh, one of these bodies uh, wasn't even publishing the minutes, uh, and the body I was on published minutes, but no way of knowing who said what. Uh, it's uh, no speaker was identified uh, by name, uh, and I suspect that my uh, that criticism may be one reason they don't want me back. Uh, but uh, who knows? Nobody's uh, ever approached me, so uh, the conflicts at least may be there, uh, but you don't really see them. I do have one other thing that I would like to talk about uh, uh, relating to HLS in the world, a theme more broadly, uh, and the role of Harvard Law School in Japanese legal education reform. Uh, Japan embarked on a major uh, set of reforms to the legal education system uh, uh, starting from 2004. It's a disaster. Uh, don't uh, ask <laughs> me about that. But uh, uh, and uh, and I, uh, the fact that I served on uh, a couple of the key advisory councils uh, uh, leaves me with some responsibility for this as well. Uh, so that does not make me very happy either. Uh, the uh, but the impetus, um, the uh, what really got the reform movement started was largely uh, a, set of, a series of two articles by Yukio Yanagida, uh, who was a, visit, uh, a leading Japanese uh, lawyer, uh, but he was visiting a professor here in 1991, uh, thereafter served on the, uh, the Dean's Advisory Council, but also the Board of uh, Overseers uh, Visiting Committee for the Law School. Uh, and he wrote these articles basically saying Japan's legal education system is flawed, uh, and you should adopt Harvard Law School as your model. Well, it was, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, suggesting a major change with a major a new set of, uh, of law schools. Uh, and that uh, became the impetus for uh, these major sets of reforms. Thereafter, during the reform process, I was on the advisory councils, uh, a couple of the key advisory councils, and my experiences there, I found that I could talk about my understanding, at least, of innovations in legal education in Australia and Canada and elsewhere, and people's eyes would glaze over. Uh, I'd talk about University of Washington. They were a bit more polite, uh, respectful there. I had, after all, been at University of Washington 12 years. And, uh, but even so, it was basically uh, nothing. And then, then I'd say, and Harvard. Suddenly, oh, Harvard, Harvard, what's Harvard doing? Uh, and it's, uh, I think, no coincidence. I, I mentioned they, they were discussing 
class size? What should be uh, to have interactive teaching? What should be the appropriate maximum class size? And one proposal was 50, one proposal was 150. Uh, and I said, you know, Harvard's just uh, instituted this major uh, new set of uh, reforms and uh, capped it at roughly 80. And suddenly, uh, 75 to 80 became the operative figure uh, in Japan. Uh, so there were a, a number of these things where I think Harvard, the Harvard name uh, and reputation made some impact on some of the concrete uh, reforms. But thereafter, uh, as the reforms, uh, uh, at least to my mind, uh, uh, completely failed to, to meet uh, the, the ideals uh, that had been set out uh, for the reforms, uh, I, I wrote a number of articles, uh, but also uh, published a book uh, together with Mr. Yanagida. Uh, and this is the, uh, the cover for the book. I had never, there's this little thing that covers the bottom, so I'd never actually seen the bottom and seen that uh, the English, uh, uh, Harvard, this immodest title, <laughs> Secrets to Its Preeminence, Learning from the Wisdom of Harvard Law School. Uh, our publisher wanted this title. Michael Sandel's Justice was very popular in Japan at the time. It was a bit of a Harvard boom. Uh, and so they were trying to uh, tap into this. The photo credited to Mark Ramsayer. Uh, there is a bit of a difference here. When Mark took the picture, he had his daughter, uh, Jenny, sitting here with her laptop. So it would look as though there was really a student uh, here studying hard. Uh, <laughs> the publisher cropped it out. They, uh, uh, they could, could, not have, could not have a p person uh, in, uh, in the, the picture. Uh, yes. Uh, and now, now my, former, uh, my former tenant in Seattle as well. Uh, the, uh, but uh, the, um, this book, so it was our goal uh, to kind of a, a rearguard action, a last uh, ditch effort to try to uh, convince Japan to uh, re-examine and, and get back to some of the ideals of the reforms. Uh, so discussion of the major curricular reforms, discussion of uh, the role of uh, clinical education uh, and uh, interdisciplinary, uh, a number of, of themes that we, uh, we tried to highlight in this, uh, basically, uh, ignored. Uh, it's the, the believers uh, say, you know, fuck, I agree with you, uh, but unfortunately it's not, not the believers we need. Uh, it's uh, it's the, uh, uh, the, the doctrinalists who have uh, pushed, the, uh, pushed the agenda. Uh, and uh, so this is yet another where they, they welcome, uh, welcome hearing of foreign views, uh, but whether they, pay, whether they uh, take them into account or not is, uh, of course, uh, something very different. Uh, and I will leave it there. Thank you guys for surviving. I thought um, at this time uh, I heard that the cocktail hour had already started, so I should, thought I should tell you. Then I also thought maybe I just have slides of your different options at the, um, at the drinks table. Uh, but, um, oh my, now we're going to fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Like, that would be totally okay. Take a little nap. No, it would be completely okay. Oh, I like it so much better in the dark. Uh, but so I'm going to talk, uh, I do not teach foreign law of any sort. Um, I do speak some other languages. I'm not really sure they have really developed legal systems in those languages. So I can't really talk about that. Mostly teach US law. I don't really know that that well. Um, I did go to law school here. Didn't take any foreign law classes. So. I'm thrilled to be on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about foreign law. But I've been interested in foreign law sort of inadvertently. So, uh, and I think that is the reason I hope that Mark invited me to talk on this. Uh, and it, it's a project that I've been hoping to get Mark involved in. And it is a project with uh, Frank and Ben's colleagues, uh, with Bob Scott at Columbia and Stephen Choi at NYU, and it's a project we've been struggling with for many years and has to do, we think, fundamentally with how law is taught. And it, it, in some ways, the, the way in which law is taught uh, that everybody in this room has suffered through, uh, thanks to people like Langdell, the sort of the case method that was originally supposed to be scientific, 
I think I think it is mostly rubbish, uh, <laughs> and that we continue to do it without much thought about whether it works, whether its basic premises work, whether or not the scientific method actually is empirically um, delivering the things it is supposed to do. So my guess is, if people have been using it for over a hundred years. Maybe it's good, but that, that's <laughs> never really. And when it comes to Harvard, and especially Harvard a hundred years ago, and you know Harvard led the charge in the insular cases a hundred years. Do you guys know about the insular cases? No, it is something you should go back and read about. Something to be greatly proud of Harvard uh, for. <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but it is around the same time that uh, we think about the case method. So as I teach, uh, All right, so a basic premise in contract theory that you would have heard uh, in any contract law class, certainly I heard it in my contract law class, I tell my students this in contract law now, I hear other people talking about it, is that, and it is when students ask us, so 95% of my students at Duke go into transactional work, mostly in New York. That was true largely of my, of my classmates at Harvard. That has been true at UCLA, other places I've taught. And students sometimes ask, why are we reading these old musty appellate cases? We don't plan to go into litigation. We hate litigation. We'll never go to a court. We want to be Wall Street lawyers, and we want to mass produce documents. That's our goal. <laughs> so, uh, and that was my goal in life. So our professors tell us that the reason you have to do this is because Contracts are written in the shadow of the law. Have you heard this? The shadow of the law. I mean, it always, your professor would tell you this with sort of this uh, degree of uh, you know, importance about the shadow of the law. Uh, it wasn't there. The Langdell didn't talk about the shadow of the law. But the basic idea is that if you want to understand how to draft a contract, you have to understand how these contracts will work out in litigation and that we draft contracts and this is basically in every sort of guide to what law students are to do. We draft contracts in order to protect against litigation. So the contract helps you in litigation. It's all about the eventual litigation. Right? So this is sort of a basic premise, not one that you should not challenge. And it's really not challenged in the literature. There are a few people who sort of questioned it from legal sociology. But we don't, we sort of largely ignore legal sociology in most US law schools. We think it's sort of a weird field. We shouldn't really talk about it. Um, now, Bob, Steve, and I have been studying contracting practices. We are anti legal sociology because all of us come from the law and economics tradition. And, but in the context of our work on contracts, over the last 15 years in studying, doing empirical work on contracts, as part of our struggle, we've interviewed a lot of lawyers. And we've written studies reporting on our interviews with lawyers in the major financial centers around the world. So New York, London, Paris, Tokyo, Frankfurt. We've done a lot of these interviews. And in the interviews, one of the things that is remarkable, and so for those of you who are fancy lawyers, some of you look like you know, you're very fancy. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're fancy lawyers, one of the things that we were told when we would interview uh, lawyers from the transactional lawyers was you know, they hadn't read a case since law school. They didn't know, know what cases looked like. And then when we would talk to their litigation colleagues, they would say, if only our transactional colleagues would read a case. They would know how to draft a contract, or we wouldn't get into these, these kinds of problems. So that's a little bit in tension with this shadow of the law, because how can you be drafting contracts in the shadow of the law if the last time you read a case was in law school? Not much of a shadow. So it does set up an empirical question. And comparative law is a way in which to think about this empirical question, we think. So let, let me, and this is really preliminary work. Uh, 
that I hope you will take with a grain of salt. I'm going to try to emphasize our findings, um, but they're only a small portion of uh, what we plan to study. So I'll give you the basic premises of what we're thinking about, uh, and this is very common. So you've probably all heard about how US contracts are longer than Japanese contracts. That's sort of the trope that is used most of the time. And you, know, you get the reason for the primary reason for US contracts being longer than Japanese contracts. So my dear friend Bob Scott teaches this at Columbia. I've heard him talk about it. Sort of US, and when we talk about US contract law, I think most of the time, we're just talking about New York. And the rest of the US doesn't really exist. Um, and New York contract law, because it's highly formalist, so people, supposedly judges, read what's in the text, and that's it, and they, that's what they give you. So you have to write a lot of stuff, because the judge is just going to do what you've written down. Whereas in Japan and Germany, they do some weird shit. And so you, know, you don't have to write that much, because you don't really know what they're going to do in the case. All right, so. But as an empirical prediction, if contracts are drafted in the shadow of law, you would expect, as people t tell you, that US contracts would look different than Japanese contracts. And there are additional, if you go into the literature, that people talk about additional differences that are very important. So judges are appointed differently in different systems. Some are bureaucratic systems, as Mark's written about. Um, some are political systems. We have elected judges. A lot of New York uh, contract law is decided by elected judges. So if you have these differences, and if our claim is that substantive law, substantive law and the way in which substantive law is applied matters to how you draft, then you should be able to lay out the different substantive laws and see contracts being different. It's a simple prediction. It's as simple as they get in comparative law. Now, when we thought about it, as I told you, we don't know squat about comparative law. None of us knows anything about comparative law. But the thing I work on are country defaults. So my specialty is helping countries when they default. And so Venezuela is on the brink of default. In fact, I thought I might not come this morning because they were supposed to default by 10 AM this morning. Uh, but the Chinese government, for whatever reason, just gave them a billion dollars this morning. So they didn't default. One and a half weeks from now, they're hoping for money from the Russians. Uh, <laughs> man, this is real. 10 AM this morning, the Chinese wired a billion dollars to them. Uh, but when countries default, it's a country, so countries' debts are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And they have debt contracts in 40, 50 different kinds of laws. Right? So because they bought stuff from all sorts of parts of the world, and they've contracted with investors all over the world. So you see, in our data, the data that we've collected over the last 15 years in country defaults, we have this incredible database of contracts from different countries under different laws. So we decided we're going to use that. And this was a nice occasion. I have you know, four of the superstars of thinking about foreign laws here. I thought I would put this up, and they can tell me why I'm completely wrong. Um, so I've, the first thing I started looking for in terms of predictions, so I didn't want just my predictions. I wanted predictions from the literature. So there's a large literature on comparative law. And there is a literature on comparative contract law. So I tried to read it. Is, sorry, you guys write in that. It is impenetrable. I am not sure what language they're writing. But they are definitely not making empirical predictions. They never say, like, US contracts will be longer than UK contracts or anything like that. I've asked my comparative contract law colleagues, and they're like, it's stupid to try to do empirical tests of these things. It is too deep for somebody like you to understand. All right, so because I'm not deep enough, I went to law firm training manuals. So if any of you run law firms, you know law firms have training manuals, especially cross-border firms like Davis Bull, Cleary Gottlieb, Skadden Arps, Sullivan and Cromwell. Many of them train lawyers across the world. So they have to tell their lawyers about how you draft contracts for different laws. And these law firm training manuals, especially the English law firm ones, are very good because they make predictions. 
and they tell you a US contract would be longer than a UK contract, and that's because in the UK, there the judges are all former barristers, and they all went to Oxford, and they played uh, whatever they play there together. Um, but you know, it's like very fancy, and they know each other, so you can have shorter contracts. In the US, are longer contracts. In Japan and Germany, it's shorter contracts. But you can get predictions. I won't bore you with all the predictions, but I felt like I had to say that. Um, so now let's look at what we do. So it's a little bit. Um, the testing is a little bit difficult, so this is what we've done so far. To compare across jurisdictions is difficult because it, you might be doing different things in different jurisdictions. So what you want is the same party contracting for the same thing in multiple jurisdictions. So what we look at is countries borrowing money across jurisdictions. Right. So Mexico is a great example because Mexico over the last 20 years has desperately needed money on many occasions. So we will borrow around the world in multiple jurisdictions. There are other countries like that sort of post the breakup of the Soviet Union. A lot of countries, uh, Eastern Europe desperately needed money and everybody was willing to lend to them. So Latin American countries and Eastern European countries, we have borrowing across the world in different jurisdictions, usually the same maturity. So for empirical purposes, I can really hold a lot of things constant. We have 12 countries borrowing across jurisdictions. Um, and right now, about 400 contracts that we can compare. We can get up to about 4,000, but I'm going to give you the basics on what we find. All right. Now, what we use as our test is you can't actually just look at the contract. So I think if you've looked at US contracts, they're big and they're thick. And Japanese and German contracts are really thin. But much of the US contract language, once you start reading it, if you have to suffer that torture, is about regulatory stuff or disclosure stuff. Or, it's not contract language. What we wanted to know is, are contract terms actually bigger in the US, or are they different in the other ways that you predict? But I'll just stick you with the bigger part. We'll just talk about that. Okay? So we have to look at specific terms. We tried to isolate the specific terms. Now another problem with contracts, especially standard form boilerplate contracts, we know they don't change a lot. So we had to find terms that change. So we need some kind of big global shock so that everybody changes. So really we're comparing at a point in time where everybody changes, do the Americans change differently from the Japanese or the Germans or the British? All right, so these are the court decisions we look at. I'm reporting to you data only on one of these court decisions, one of these sets of court decisions. We have decisions from Europe um, and, it, and the US that sort of affected the whole, the international legal market for government debt. So it's a multi-trillion dollar market. So this is it, these are our bottom lines. So they're supposed to be different. US contracts are supposed to be much longer. So these are for the provisions. These are the differences we find. Right, so the bigger green line, that's the difference in words for the provisions. We've normalized it across the terms. They're basically identical. In terms of length, they're just the same. They all do the same thing, whether they have you know, British judges who wrote crew or US judges who were elected or you know, Japanese judges who were bureaucrats. They use the same contract language, and it says the same thing if you read it. There is a tiny bit of variation in the US contracts. Anybody want to guess what, what the variation in the US contracts come from? Oh, please. States? State? No, no, these are all New York. <laughs> we use Latin more. Believe it or not, we use Latin words more. We understand Latin less, but we use Latin words more. <laughs> I don't understand that. We have more typos. <laughs> the New York contracts have more typos. And we use sort of um, multiple words for the same thing. So a Japanese contract might say something like reasonable. The New York contract will say like, best reasonable. What the hell does best reasonable mean? And what, why is it adding? And why are you charging somebody $1,500 to add best in front of reasonable? That's what we do in the US contracts. But they're basically the same. So the, the second bar, and again, these are very simplified initial data. The second bar, bar is variation. So one is length, and the other is variation. So this is a rough, normalized measure. US contracts have much more variation. 
So when we look at variation, we use a computational linguistic techniques that I cannot explain to you because I had to hire somebody who's much better at math than I am to do these. But in terms of variation, we look at, we are very creative in the US. So we vary in terms of number of typos, the number of, the types of words we use to mean the same thing. We also, we're really creative with fonts. We use lots of different kinds of fonts and paragraph structures. Is true. This is deep stuff. Mark, don't laugh at me. All right, so that's the variation. We vary a lot in the US. It's interesting, the Japanese and German contracts vary very little. They just, those contracts march in lockstep. Font, page number, if I want to look at the negative pledge clause, I know it's on page seven of every Japanese contract. So it's very convenient. But I had always thought in the US we had better clauses because we read it and we changed it. Turns out we, no, they're just the same. All right, so um, what is significantly different though, so the, and I think this is uh, the tip of the iceberg for what we're trying to study. And I, I don't know about it, but I, I'm hoping Mark will have some answers about it, is um, the time. So we looked at these shocks, right, big cases. We looked at the clauses, the new clauses that each jurisdiction looked, used. The number of years it takes for the change to occur is significantly different. So in the US and the UK, once there's sort of an industry standard clause, the markets move relatively quickly. In Japan and Germany, and we have other jurisdictions, I just figured these were the ones we were probably most familiar with, it, the movement is much slower. Even though they are significantly smaller markets and people know each other more. Right? So it's just a few firms that are doing, doing the business, but they're much slower to adopt innovation. But they make many fewer mistakes. Right? So the contracts are a little bit better. Um, now, uh, the last. Um, so what does, it, what does it tell us? I, I think Mark would tell me, do more research. Spend another 10 years doing. So that's what I'm going to do, because I know that's what Mark would tell me. But he does make me question, why are the contracts the same? Because the theory that contracts should be different if the litigation system is different seems exactly right. That should be true. But that's only true if the reason you're writing contracts is in anticipation of litigation, the core thing that we teach students. And so it, it causes me to ask, whether or not the reason transaction lawyers don't read, the con re don't read appellate cases is because when they draft contracts, it's not in anticipation of litigation. It is for some other reason, some other sort of sociological reasons. The kinds of things that Stuart Macaulay in his classic 1963 piece, which is sort of one of the greatest pieces ever written but never really read, it's titled Non-Contractual Relations in Contracts. So that's sort of all I have, is that I started with a puzzle, and I'm even more puzzled, but I hope that my great colleagues here will tell me. Thank you.